My guest today is Dr. Harlan Kilstein. Harlan is an author, entrepreneur, lifestyle coach, and copywriting expert. I met him many years ago when he sought out my help in decoding the other-than-conscious communication work of Dr. Dave Dobson. Dave and his OTCC will be the main topic of our first conversation starting now on the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Harlan Kilstein, welcome to the uh, Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. It's nice to see you. I am very happy to be here. I, oh. you know, I have been hoping and praying for the day that I would make it to this podcast. And it, it's, finally, <laughs> it's finally arrived. We're here. I'm overjoyed. I can't do it. I've made it. I feel like it's at the I need to thank the Academy, first of all, for being here. <laughs> I've been hoping and praying to lead my people to the promised land. That's uh, true. It's all about the love, coaches. you know. It's all about the love. One minute we slap someone, and the next minute it's all about the love. So I'm here, ready. Oh, that was an Academy Awards yeah. joke, folks. Yes. So yes. Okay. This it, is it, a very serious podcast. Very topical joke for this morning, but it'll be very old very soon. For anybody listening to this thing. Anyway, so um, Harlan Kilstein, one of the reasons I brought you here, asked you to be here today on this podcast is that you and I have something in common. And it is something that many people won't even know what we're talking about until we start talking about it. But it is uh, the fact that we both studied with a guy named Dr. Dave Dobson and learned from him what he referred to as other than conscious communication. Um, Many people watching what he did refer to it as hypnosis, or maybe even, you know, Ericksonian hypnosis. I don't know if you can see my air quotes here, Ericksonian hypnosis. He would tell you that although he met Erickson once, the kind of work he did was nothing the same as that he was speaking to a person other than conscious. And we, you and I both went to, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight fun shops. Yeah. You know, to find out what that meant and how he did it. And if we could do it too. So I wanted to get your take on all this stuff for uh, people who perhaps know a little bit about Dobson or nothing at all. So So, interestingly that Dobson was a little bit of a legend in the NLP community. Um, He was a legend for his other than conscious communication, but you could find absolutely in nothing in print about what other than conscious communication was. It was something that he just did. He was a little bit of an anomaly because whenever someone discovered something in NLP, they rushed to put out a book. They rushed to put out a program. Dobson was nothing like this. He actually hoarded his information. Mm -hmm. And I think that the first seminar that I arranged to do with Dave and brought maybe 30 people to see him was the first seminar that he actually let people buy. And from that point on, he started um, letting people buy them. The problem is that Dave was doing things that you either had to be there or you needed a decoder ring Hmm. to find out what he was doing. The first time I went to see Dave Dobson, here I am, I brought a whole bunch, a room full of people, at least 30 people, were sitting in his basement at his home in um, Friday Harbor on San Juan Island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And that's a bit of an exaggeration, Harlan. It is off the coast of Seattle. Um, Still in the Pacific Ocean. (laughs) Not in the middle of... It was right next to Borneo, someplace like that. It's it's not at all. 
Um, before you go any further with this made up tale, you're about to just force us. Um, Harlan, when you say he was a legend in the NLP community, t- tell me about that. What, what legend are you talking about? Cause there's plenty of people in the NLP community that never heard of the guy. So he did, a, he did a seminar with, um, John Grinder, Robert Dilt, Stephen Gilligan, Judy Delosier, and a bunch of other people who were Grinder fanatics. And the first person up to teach was John Grinder. And then he introduced um, Robert Diltz, and then they introduced Dave. And Dave, as he walked up to the front, turned to a woman who he had never spoken with, handed her an imaginary crystal ball and said, here, would you hold my crystal ball for me? And the woman held out her hands, received the um, uh, the imaginary crystal ball and was in a deep trance in front of the entire audience. And people were like, how the hell did he do that? Um, and people understood that there was something about Dobson that broke the mold. But he didn't get up there and say, you're probably curious about what I did. Let me explain it. Uh-uh. You either figured out on your own what Dave was doing or you weren't going to get it. And that was something that carried through. Mm. He wanted someone, he wanted a student who was going to decode and pay attention to what he did um, and pretty much figure it out on his own. He left plenty of hints, but he was the most confusing teacher that I ever met. Confusing, but brilliant. Just so you know, when I first met Dave, um, he was a guest presenter at a Tony Robbins certification course that I was attending. So it was 1985, no, 86. And um, I'd heard talk about Milton Erickson a great deal. Every hypnosis, I'm sorry, every uh, NLP seminar that I went to, whether it was Tony Robbins or Tad James or whatever at that point, had always referenced uh, uh, Milton Erickson. And they talked about, you know, Ericksonian language patterns and embedded commands and how Erickson could, you know, get people into trance by telling stories and stuff like that. But um, nobody ever taught it. They just talked about it. And so finally, when I was at this Tony Robbins certification course, Um, out comes Dave Dobson, who was kind of the antithesis of what I would expect somebody invited to a Tony Robbins course as a presenter to be. He was anything, anything but like Tony, you know, he was a little bit overweight. He had this long beard, seemed like a long beard at the time, kind of Santa Claus like figure. I could have sworn he'd been smoking just before he walked out on the stage and he probably had been. I I, I visualized him actually smoking on stage, although I don't think that was the case. But he then launched into telling these Ericksonian-like stories, you know, just these Moran, Miranding, that's not the right word. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they Miranded. They, Harlan, help me out here. What's the word I'm looking for when they, the, the, when a story meander, meanders, they meandered. Yeah. Sorry, they meandered about. Um, and then everybody was falling asleep, you know, while they listened to him. And, and then I realized I was like the only person still awake in the room because I was on the edge of my seat fascinated by him and then I realized oh my goodness these people aren't being rude and sleeping they're they're in a trance that he was you know kind of doing this this trance um and so I thought oh my god he's doing Ericksonian hypnosis and when I finally I kind of said that to him he kind of bit, bit my head off and this is at a much later date I um, said, I, I never met Eric. I met Erickson once, but this is nothing like Ericksonian work. This is other than conscious communication. So he wasn't a legend as far as I was concerned, but he was very fascinating to me. And because when I saw those people trancing, and then when he did a sort of what he called a, 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 a formal induction, later he was a tuxedo, tuxedo trance. A tuxedo trance, a formal induction, yeah. <laughs> it was like I was out and so was everybody else for i guess a half an hour or so but it seemed like minutes and so that got my attention and i felt felt like okay i need to know what this guy's doing 
so that's my story about how I you know, first started going with Eric with Dobson, and I I then went to the next uh, fun shop that was available, which was I think the following May in Friday Harbor, Washington, uh, May 1986, probably 87, possibly. At any rate, you were about to tell a story about um, you had set up a training, and it took I place. Set up a training. We we're in Dave's basement in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and, um, Right. And how could I forget? And Dave <laughs> is being so obtuse. I brought friends in from all around the world. Okay. The closest friends were the ones in Canada who just took a ferry over. Um, but I had friends come all the way from Jerusalem, Israel wow. to do this. And Dave is, Lord knows what he's doing. At that point, one of Dave's longest students said, do you think this would be a good time to explain to the good folks here what you've been doing? And Dave growled at him and said, I warned you, not a word. And I went, Dave's been doing something? Hmm. I can't detect it. So I like started paying attention, watching everything that he did. And I turned to my friend who had trained with Bandler and Grinder. We're talking mm-hmm. about all the way back to the original groups, training with them. And he was like, I don't know what he's doing. And we spent the better part of a week decoding what he was doing. And then we found this guy afterwards. His name was O'Brien. And and we got him on the phone and said, okay, what in the world was he doing? And we started comparing notes and found out that we were pretty much at the same level of, of understanding. Well, I'm the kind of person that if you put a problem in front of someone, I'm not going to give up. Mm-hmm. And I went back so many times to study with Dobson that at the final time, um, I ended up sitting next to him and I understood pretty much everything he was doing, why he had people switch seats, why he was gesturing, why he was moving his legs at a particular time. So, it took a very long time, but not only did I crack a code, I found out that there was a code. Yeah. And in fact, that what Dave is doing is replicable. Wow. Um, and I have spent so many years doing this. As a matter of fact, as you know, I'm working on a book because Dave claimed that there was a book coming. I heard him claim that it had been written. He was working on the cover. That was the only drawback or the only stopping block from it being published. Is he wasn't there, the cover. Apparently, he had only written a couple of pages. Oh, really? And, and hadn't, and it was in some, um, he wrote it in some word processor where they couldn't even access the files. It was nothing much, nothing really significant. Hmm. So, I decided, you know what, my mission is going to be um, to put this book out. It's tentatively titled The Wizard of San Juan Island. San Juan Island, by the way, is that island in the middle of the Pacific (laughs) Ocean. Off the coast of Seattle. It's... (laughs) And, and, um, yeah, it's off the coast. There's only a 90-minute ferry ferry, uh, ride to get there. And the um, era, by the way, let me just ask you this, Hal. Um, this code that you'd say that you've been cracking, it's the other than conscious communication that Dave is talking about. That is correct. The other than conscious communication is that Dave believed that in the initial meeting with someone, it is possible to create instant rapport. I don't mean NLP type rapport with mirroring, matching, posture, breathing. I'm talking in less than a second rapport. Hmm. And and use that rapport 
as a tool for communication for as long as you have a relationship with that person. Dave had different greetings and signals for uh, people. Um, with me, because of my Jewish uh, background, um, Dave would start, uh, he took the words to Hava Nagila and changed it to have some tequila. And, and when Dave wanted to direct some communication to me, he would start moving the way Jews at prayer sway. And I would hear, <laughs> and I knew that the communication was directed at me. But, did you, but, was he humming that or did you hear it in the, the back end? No, he was, he was, he would, he would hum it because he was playing with me, but he didn't need to do that. You know, uh, he could just look at me and like, I'd be gone. Um, and, and he had, but it all stemmed from that initial thing. And while Dave did not teach things. The only thing he really did teach people how to do was that other than conscious greeting, which he called the other than conscious hello. Yeah. Because to him, it was the ultimate in courtesy to acknowledge another person's communication. And this to him was the most authentic way of doing it. Of course, he took that communication to several steps. If he wanted you to go into trance, he would just shift his head and walk to your ear and out you would go. He could look to the left side of the room and have the right side of the room go in trance and do the exact opposite. Mm. Um, I was there in a few times where he did um, a pre-surgical hypnosis thing. And there was going to be this formal hypnosis, the air quotes, um, at the end. And, um, but during the session that would lead up to it, if you looked at the person who was going to get the pre-surgical pain, they spent most of the training in trance. Hmm. Um, so Dave was a very big believer in covert work, helping people covertly. Hmm. It's interesting. You know, the first time I went to a fun shop, as I mentioned, back in the eighties, um, it was two weeks long and it was, uh, five, five days on and two days off. And we were in Friday Harbor, Washington, where there's, not an awful lot of activity. It's not like a teeming metropolis. I mean, if you like outdoor activities, there's plenty of that stuff, kayaking, whatnot. Um, and then there was another five days of training after that. Um, what I found to be really my motivating, why I, why I went is that um, I had been told by a number of people that had, were really good at NLP, people that I'd known who were already trainers and stuff, that they had gone to see Dave and that they didn't know what he did, but that after having gone to this fun shop, because didn't, Dave didn't like workshops, he wanted to have it be a fun shop. But after going to this fun shop, they were better at whatever it was that they were doing. They were, they were better at NLP. They, all, this, all the NLP processes they did had better outcomes. They were just better at it. And I found it really kind of interesting because that the first two weeks that I was there, the first thing, it was kind of like a blur. I, I really didn't remember much of anything. So I went back to a second time so that my conscious mind could get in on it as well. And I had this really fascinating moment of opening at one point where, you know, some visual memory sort of came back into my consciousness in a very interesting way kind of like the clouds parting and suddenly I could see my internal visualizations that I'd never been able to do previously it was really interesting that a lot of my systems got opened up much more through this uh I had similar experience of, of finding my systems opening up to now even though god he passed away so many years ago um when I see people I can't turn the damn thing off. Mm. I'm noticing 
things that to me they are completely out in the open and to other people are like are you sure you saw that um Could you give us an example and let me just ask you a question why does anyone care that we're talking about this stuff like what what is dave is no longer around he died in what nine, 2004 or something like that yeah. um he's no no longer around to teach these things he didn't write a book um you're writing a book but um what what's so important about having your systems turned on? What's so important about being able to notice other than conscious communication? How does a, a coach who's working in the coaching business benefit from these skills, these abilities to see patterns and see uh, visual well, metric and aesthetic stuff? Go ahead. I think the best illustration that I can give you, because you can probably still find it on your own, is to look for the Netflix video, I Am Not Your Guru, that was made about Tony Robbins. Okay. It starts with an exchange between Tony and a young boy who was planning on killing himself. And if you watch that video, what you are seeing is Tony cloning Dave Dobson. He is watching every minor thing that this, we'll call him client, um, is doing from changes in his breathing, shallow breathing, skin color, and his calibration of what the guy is doing so accurate that he knows whether what he's doing is working or not working based on the responses. And Tony keeps getting the appropriate signals of, yes, go on, because otherwise, Tony, who is, you know, on camera and doing something, would probably have just brought it to a rapid conclusion. But because he's getting high quality information, even without asking the question, he knows where the client is at all times and that his interventions are working. Interesting. A lot of people suffer. I don't mean to insult anybody here, but. This is a Dave language. What are you looking at me when you say that? What do you mean? Some people don't want to insult anybody here. There's is, two of us. Is Dave uses a term called RCV. Oh, yeah. RCV is called reticular canal vision, or as Dave used to say. Rectal, rectal canal rectal, vision. Rectal, well, that was on his, his polite days. He called it reticular, <laughs> but he meant rectal. Um, in other words, someone's head is up their ass because they're not looking at what's going on. Now, I found this fabulous picture of someone who had his head going up his butt, and I brought it to Dave, and I showed it to him, and he said, Harlan, where'd you get that amazing picture of yourself? (laughs) that 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 was Dave. But a lot of people are so, um, concerned about what's going on inside them. They're ignoring this tremendous feedback uh, machine in front of them that is letting them know exactly what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And once you start the ability to calibrate and know when someone is in a problem state or when, when the problem has solved, um, you really can check if they're done. Now, Dave used to check his work in different systems to see if everything was integrated. So different systems, meaning visual or auditory or kinesthetic. Kinesthetic. And he would check in all of the systems to see if the problem was solved. And he was constantly looking for agreement in the systems. If there wasn't agreement in the systems, he said that the person was incongruent. Mm -hmm. And incongruence and Dave's model could mean that the problem was still there, or it might've been solved in one system, Mm -hmm. but there was still some kind of crap lurking back there in other systems that still needed work. If I might um, uh, tell a story, a Dobson story about this, this exact um, situation. Dobson once said that he had a, a psychiatrist come to see him, come to the Island for some, for some work. And, um, the, the guy was at his doorstep and Dave had done, as you said, that 
sort of instant rapport thing of seeing how he said yes, how he said no, and getting his you know, other than conscious hello thing. And then he said, the guy said that he, he had come for some hypnosis. And Dave said, oh, well, that's very interesting. Um, is it appropriate? And the guy said yes with his mouth. He said, yes, that's why I came. But as other than conscious communication, you know, this way he was saying yes or no in the other systems were incongruent in saying he was basically showing Dave his other than conscious no. So although the man had said consciously, yes, I'm ready to start and was expected to be ushered into the treatment room, Dave instead said, well, tell you what, there's a nice restaurant downtown. Why don't you go get yourself a cup of coffee and come back when you feel it is in fact appropriate to do some hypnosis and the guy came back after an hour and and said and i'm ready for some hypnosis and dave said is it appropriate and again the guy said yes consciously with his mouth and yet his other than conscious communication was you know shaking his head or whatever it was no so dave said you know did you notice by that coffee shop there's a little souvenir store why don't you go around look in there see if there's something that you might want to take home for you as a souvenir and come back when it's appropriate and apparently, according to Dave's story, this went on for days. You know, <laughs> I kept coming back and saying, I want some hypnosis. And Dave would say, is it appropriate? And he'd get his other than conscious no. And finally, the story ends up that the guy comes back and he's been, I don't know how long this has gone on, maybe hours, maybe days, I don't know. But finally, he comes back and Dave says, is it appropriate? And the guy goes, I don't know if it's appropriate. And <laughs> But his other than conscious mind has shifted as his verbiage is like, I don't know. But his, the rest of him was totally congruently, yes, I'm ready for some hypnosis. And Dave has, you know, said to him, that's good enough for me. Come on in. Have a seat right over there and went and did the hypnosis. So that congruence of the parts, different systems, you know, saying yes in the way was, was critical to Dave's work. So there was a time that I was with um, out Dave, and Dave was teaching us a what I call the pattern buster technique. Uh-huh. And um, we were performing the technique with someone and a partner, and Dave was watching me do the technique and saw that my partner hadn't done it appropriately. So we're sitting down and Dave is talking and Dave did the technique on me while I was listening to his lecture. And I remember at what point Dave told a really particularly foul, dirty joke. Dave Dobson? (laughs) I was the only person in the room who started laughing hysterically. And I was laughing so hard that I couldn't stop. And I was looking around going, why am I the only one laughing? And Dave ended then uh, for a short break. And I went up to people and said, why was I laughing like that? And people said, well, do you really want to know? And I said, yes, while non-verbally shaking my head, no. Hmm. And so they respected the communication, and I had no clue as to what he had done. Months later, I got the recordings from Dave, and I listened to it, and I heard that session, and I went, Oh, that son of a bitch. <laughs> um, because I figured out what he had done what did and do? why I was laughing hysterically. Um, I was like, man, he was he was a um a lion-hearted uh person who would stop at nothing to get results. And there was something that I went out there to get, and Dave wanted a pattern broken and since that time gosh so many years ago um i never had a recurrence of that situation all done completely covertly now most people who would have gone at him would have um missed entirely 
even even in the recording that oh that bastard that's what he did how did you pick up from the recording what he had done non-verbally um because I remembered the topic that came immediately before and the technique that he had been teaching. I thought that he was done with the topic and now we were moving on. Uh But Dave wanted to use the topic on me because he saw that I hadn't gotten what I came for. So he he did the exact technique that he had just taught us and I never saw it coming. But when I listened to it, like, Oh, that's <laughs> when I started laughing. Up gotcha. Gotcha. It wasn't the funniest, you know, vulgar joke I've ever heard. Um, but it was just the way Dave told it and exactly when he inserted the punchline that blew out my patterns. Wow. Quite interesting. Yeah, that, you know, that's a pattern I've, I've tried to teach as effectively as Dave taught it. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure which one of those is less true. I don't know if Dave taught it all that effectively all the time. He wasn't the best teacher necessarily. He admitted that as much. Um, but it's, I, I don't even have a name for that. What what do you call that? The pattern blowout? What did you call it? a pattern blowout. Interesting. I just, I call it the across the room pattern interrupt process, which is not a good name. You see, there was a difference between it being a pattern Pattern interrupts Dave used to do all the time. Mm -hmm. He would tell jokes. um, He would, you know, just laugh. He loved jokes. That's why he called it fun shops instead of workshops. But a pattern interrupt is one level. A pattern blowout was it's never going to happen again. Can, Can you, can you describe the difference? What is what is for the what for the benefit of our audience? What what is a pattern interrupt, and why is that a good thing? Well, if someone has a non-useful pattern and they're just running it again, let's say someone is um, is a raging audio, and they are so wrapped up in their own internal audio that they aren't fully there. They're, they're lost in their audio. Well, Dave might have done things to interrupt their audio with like, making noises as if, you know, he had some kind of thing, anything to interrupt the audio. So or that's might, why he did that around me all the time. So he <laughs> may have been, or he may have like been start drumming or something like that, or start humming a song. Dave had a bunch of songs that he would, you know, old, real old songs. Like the his favorite was uh, Judy Garland. Every little uh, movement has a meaning of his own, and he would start to sing that. But those were minor pattern interrupts. Hmm. What Dave did in this case was ask people to tell a funny story and a sad story. And when you told the funny story and the sad story, when a person does that, there are nonverbals that they tell. So in the sad story, their tonality might be down, their head might be lowered, um, their breathing rate might be different. And, um, and when they're happy, every, everything, tonality, pace is different. Dave would calibrate both. Mm -hmm. And then when he told a joke, in my case, a filthy joke, at the same time that he um, related the punchline of the filthy joke, he used my um, non-functional, my sad pattern tonality to tell that joke. And here you are, the punchline of a joke, tone w- combined with your own um, uh, with your own negative pattern shift. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like a humidifier and dehumidifier getting into a room to have a fight. <laughs> um, Good metaphor. 
And it just blows out the pattern for good. And these were the kinds of things that Dave did every single day. Mm -hmm. But he never explained, this is what I'm doing. He he had this love-hate relationship with his teachings that he was constantly afraid that people were going to steal his teachings. And especially if someone was an NLP trainer, Dave didn't just think it, he was sure of it. And so um, he could be um, hostile at times. There was a friend of yours who came out to a seminar and the person was um, playing. Um, there were like three balls in their hand and they were like spinning the balls while they were listening. Mm -hmm. And Dave made a seriously obnoxious comment about that. I think it was like, you know, do you always like playing with your balls? Mm -hmm. um, and the person didn't take it um, at all the right way. I'm not sure Dave um, cared all that much because he was convinced that this guy was going to steal his thing. But what he was doing was the person was stuck in their audio. The person is a major audio person. And Dave was basically indicating while you're doing this thing with your hands, you are stuck inside your own internal audio, shutting everything else off, and you are limiting yourself. Um, Dave could have done that overtly, and the person might have gone, oh, that's interesting. I never considered that. Mm -hmm. but Dave didn't do it that way. He had a, you know, let me know when you're ready to stop playing with your balls because you might want to learn something. Right. Um, and did it, chose the off color. I don't think it went over particularly well, and the person didn't realize that Dave was trying to help him. But right. Right. that was Dave. Sometimes he was, you know, helpful and creative when someone was suffering, and sometimes he would tell a joke that didn't go over. He was <laughs> so, so what's the advantage of a pattern interrupt in general? Should, should coaches learn how to do pattern interrupts? Is it important to coaching? Oh, absolutely. If a person is stuck and you see a repetitive behavior, the kindest thing you can do is interrupt the pattern and suggest that they might want to make different choices. If you want to get really good results with um, clients, you need to look at on, on a micro level at their behaviors and see if they are running patterns. One of the things that Dave believed is that essentially all behavior is patterned behavior. It's either useful or non-useful. If it's non-useful, interrupt the non-useful behavior and direct them to adopt something that works better for them. Yeah. If it's a useful behavior, then you let it keep going. But he believed that most people were limited by their patterns. I was just um, on that topic. I was looking through this old Tony Robbins manual I got from, gosh, what year is this? 1990. Two maybe ninety one. Um, I could probably find out specifically, but let's say around that time. And in this manual, also there's these playing cards that Tony had put together, and one of them is um, this thing called the Sinbor model. It's one of the things. These are little playing cards to try to learn these different. He, I think at this point he wasn't calling it NLP anymore. He was calling it NAC or something like that. Um, a brief time period of time, Tony switched NLP to NCS for neuro code systems. Then he finally arrived at neuro associative conditioning or NAC. But nevertheless, he was trying to these different names. So the SINBOR model, I don't know what SINBOR stands for exactly, but it's um, the purpose, it says on the back of the card, is to interrupt a limiting pattern by causing a radical shift in focus. And there's five master patterns, and then you interrupt those patterns and you have a linkage. To, so you know, Tony's trying to systematize this idea that Dobson was always, you know, demonstrating and doing of interrupting the patterns in order for people to get, you know, new 
new and improved patterns. Right. Yeah. So cool. over time, um, Dobson just started seeping into my brain. And when I look at things, I just wonder how I can, I'm looking at people and seeing, are they useful patterns? Do they need to be interrupted? Has the person asked me for help? Yeah. Um, Dave, that's a very, very important thing. Um, generally, you don't want to go around interrupting people's patterns if they haven't asked you to. Well, I suppose if Dave saw somebody who was particularly rude, he might have um, done something um, just to help make the world a nicer place. But generally, Dave was very strict about, did the person come to you for help? And in and are they paying you? Right. Which was a big motivation of his as well. You know, is this in fact a, a, a professional relationship? Are they asking for help? Are they actually requesting it so much so that they are hiring you to, to do it? If that was the case, then he was at full service you know, to, to make that happen. Yeah. And it's also interesting. I believe that maybe it was him. It might've been uh, Stephen Heller who told me this one. Stephen Heller was uh, a colleague of of Dave's early on, I think, if I recall correctly. At any rate, Stephen Heller, the author of Monsters and Magical Sticks might've been the source of this, but I think it was Dave where he said, you know, you're not being paid to be the person's friend. You know, you're, you're not being paid to, you know, rapport is nice. That's all a good thing, but you're not being paid to be their friend. You're being paid to get results. You know, they, they want, they came in with this problem. They want to have this problem gone. They want to have this new, you know, functional patterning in, 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 in place when they leave. Um, that's, that's your job, you know, not to say, boy, what a wonderful guy that Dave Dobson was. Um, but to, you know, have these old patterns removed and the new patterns installed yeah um i remember once just i don't know how long we we have but i'll just tell you one last story this was the last time i was with dave um and, and i as i mentioned i got to sit next to him or in close proximity to him and at one point someone on one side of the room is taking Dave's picture. And Dave said, oh, you take my picture? Would you mind taking it from the other side? I have a much better, um, I think I look better from the other side. And then he looked over there and said, "Um, young lady, would you mind switching seats with him so he could take my picture? Now, instantly, I knew that Dave's real goal was to have the lady move because I had seen her response to a question Dave had asked and knew what was going on. So they switch seats. The guy keeps taking Dave's picture. At the break, the woman comes up to me and says, does Dave know my problem? I said, yes. And she said, and do you know my problem? I said, yes. And she said, I'm too embarrassed. I can't go on. And she walked away. And she came back and she said, what am I supposed to do that people know my problem? And I said, well, now that you know that Dave knows your problem, why not trust that he also knows what to do? and go back in and see what happens. And she went back in and spent the rest of the afternoon in a deep trance while Dave taught the class. He was directing messages of comfort to this woman um, while he was teaching a room of about 20 or 30 people. Um, He had that ability. And then afterwards, I asked, the woman outside, Um, I didn't ask about her experience because Dave believed that a person's trance, he used the term, is their own private garden. Mm -hmm. I don't ask them about their trance. 
And I said, are you happy you stayed? And she was like almost giddy. And she said, yes, I'm glad you made me stay. Um, she never asked me what the problem was, how I knew what the problem, how Dave knew what the problem was. It wasn't necessary. Dave just gathered the information. She had paid to attend his fun shop. And he took that as she was here to change. And it was his job to help her. And it was quite amazing. No one else in the room had a clue as to what was going on. And, and I will say that over the years that I went, I went to, I, I have lost track. I've went to five, six, maybe seven fun shops over the years. Um, I noticed that there were a number of people always that um, were not there t- as professionals. They were, they were there for basically therapy. You know, they were there for interventions to have those old patterns removed and the new patterns installed. And that's why they attended the workshop. Um, people got that whether they wanted to or not, because, you know, Dave was there to do that. One of his reasons, I think, for doing these fun shops was to really, you know, covertly, if you will, help people change in positive ways. And in addition, perhaps occasionally to teach something that would be useful on a left-brained level as well. I remember asking him that time I put together the first seminar, would you like them to fill out an intake form so that you know what people want when they um, come into your fun shop? That was when you were still using the RCV? Were you? Uh, yeah, I was, it was very, it was for my first work. I hadn't even attended a day <laughs> this time. And Dave goes, no, Harlan, that won't be necessary. I'll find out what they need as soon as they walk into the room. Right. And so I discovered how he did that. He wasn't joking. Now, it's, it's also very interesting to me that Dave, do you have a few more minutes? I know we're sure. running, running close to the end of our time here. But um, you know, Dave, Dave was very, I don't know, um, critical perhaps of people who had too much, what he considered to be too much auditory going on. But he himself was totally deaf in one ear and a lot of deaf in the other ear. So he had two hearing aid, aids going on. Um, he had, and it, this is back in the day, this is pre digital stuff. So he had a he, very clear uh, hearing aid in one ear and another very obvious hearing aid in the other ear and a wire that ran from one, one to, the other. Aid yeah. to the other. So this wire was underneath his chin over to the other ears. So um, because it was basically taking in sound from, let's say, the right side that he was totally deaf in. I don't know if that's true or not, but the side that he was totally deaf in and connecting over to the, um, you know, the quote unquote good ear, they could hear something at all. So he was all hear- hearing from the one ear. So he had no directional sound. He, he didn't know where sounds were coming. Right. He would from. very often be like, who said that? <laughs> yeah. Looking around the room. Yeah. And, um, but maybe because of this auditory challenge that he had, he was hyper perhaps acute of the visual things happening in him. He, he would notice stuff, you know, subtle cues, subtle cues of people's, you know, intentions, people's uh, uh, patterns that were going on. It's so acute with his awareness of those, of those things. Do you think that might be accurate? Sure. And the same thing with Erickson. My favorite Erickson story in similar mode was that people thought Erickson saw everything. So one day when he came in, Erickson had collections of little things. And one of them was a little ironwood owl. Where's my owl? Oh, it's in the other room. Um, little ironwood owl. And they um, took the ironwood owl. It was in a room um, uh, crowded with knickknacks. They took the owl and they just lay it down flat. And everybody just sat and listened to Erickson teach. And as Erickson was being wheeled out of the room by his wife, he held up his hand for her to pause and turned around and he said, oh, that thing that you were wondering if I'd noticed? Well, I don't give a hoot about it. <laughs> and um, and then they realized, like, the guy did not miss a thing. And, and Dobson was, was pretty much the same thing. He knew 
everything from skin color changes to, you know, marks on people's faces and was constantly calibrating. He was one of a kind. Sadly, he had this issue of um, not wanting to share what he was doing, fear of being ripped off, and therefore cracking the code became necessary. Um, But he was truly a talented person. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. I think that's also possible that... um, you know, he, that idea of being courteous to the other than conscious mind, he was big on that, you know, the courtesy, the appropriateness, you know, is it appropriate to do the hypnosis, et cetera. And I don't think that necessarily everyone who learns this sort of other than conscious communication will necessarily have the same level of values attached to the courteousness. And is it appropriate to influence, you know, they, they might want to use these skills for less um, noble outcomes let's just say that's correct so again only a handful of people are left who even remember dave much less his teachings Mm. that's why i have this crazy mission to get it out there so that more people can use it and help more people well hopefully when will your book book be coming out there carly five six five six chapters done just a matter of getting time but i do have a book coming out a lot sooner yeah, um, that's going to be called the um, collected stories of Dave Dobbs. Oh, really? How cool is that? That sounds fantastic. And to be fair, there there is still material available. I believe that you can still one can get um, material of Dave at otcc.com. Is no, that it's, what's it? It's at, it's at excelquest.com. Uh, Barb Step has some stuff. I'm just going to warn you though. I, while I wish everybody would learn this stuff. Learning it without a guide is probably going to be difficult. You're probably going to think, oh, that Kilstein guy. And, you know, up until that class, I really like Doug O'Brien, but <laughs> suggesting that I buy this stuff. Here's a wacko guy yelling at everybody and insulting <laughs> them and telling them stories. I'm here to tell you that there was a method to his madness. Okay, fair warning. All right. So don't go buy Dave Dobson stuff at, or, or not. Just wait for the book. It'll be just as good. All right, been, Harlan. Yeah. Harlan, we're going to have you back because in addition to your um, expertise in this field, you are also an uh, expert marketer. And so um, part of the deal here at the uh, Essential Coaching Skills Podcast is to help people find out the systems and the secret that kept, keep the best, set the best apart when it comes to being a coach and how to market themselves as a coach so that people can come and find them and make a living as a coach. When, when we do that, yeah. when we do that session, I just want you to know that it's going to be so practical, so many things for you to do. You're actually going to want to take notes on the podcast and put them into effect because we can fill your schedule with coaching clients rather quickly and easily. Wow. That is. So so you may be walking around with like, you know, signs of like Doug for president or something. (laughs) Um, But we're we're serious that it will be a benefit to you. Beautiful. Well, we look forward to that. And for today, thank you so much for being here today. Okay. I'm going to do my other than conscious Goodbye. Oh, one question for you, Harlan, before you go, is um, how do people find you if they want to find Harlan Kilstein or more about what you do? Um, Look for me on Facebook. Um, I'm available. Just send me a message. If we're not friends, um, I look in my other box and find it and respond. Do you still have a website? It's coming. The Dobson website is definitely coming. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you. All right. See you again soon. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode 
of the Central Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks. <laughs>